Welcome to today's webinar presented by SCM Talent Group, the 10 strategies to hire and retain supply chain talent. My name is Katie Kurz and I will be presenting today's presenter. Before we get started, I wanted to let you all know that we will end the webinar with a question and answer session. So feel free throughout to add any questions you have in the chat box. This webinar will be recorded and both the PowerPoint slides and recorded webinar will be shared with all attendees after the presentation. Feel free to share this with anyone else who might find the material beneficial. We have a great presenter today sharing his expertise with you, Rodney Apple. Without further ado, here's Rodney. Thank you very much, Katie, <clears throat> and thanks for everyone for taking time out of your day to attend uh, this webinar. Again, we're going to cover 10 strategies to hire and retain supply chain talent. I'm going to start with a quick introduction, uh, get into the agenda that we're going to cover today, and then we'll move forward from there. So quick introduction, again, the name is Rodney Apple, founder of SCM Talent Group. We are a national supply chain recruiting and executive search firm based out of Asheville, North Carolina. I've been recruiting for about 23 years since I got out of college and um, have spent about half the time on the corporate side. The other half I've spent on you know, the agency or search side. Um, started dabbling in supply chain recruiting back in the late 90s, and I've been in it full-time since 2001. I joined the Home Depot. They were Fortune 13 at the time. Uh, my objective was to recruit and build the very first supply chain department for the Home Depot. Uh, so I did that and then um, you know, continued on to lead all of the professional and executive recruitment for their global logistics and supply chain organization. Did that for a few years and then went over to the Home Depot started out leading recruitment for their uh, manufacturing group, so 22 plants in North America, everything from plant manager down to um, maintenance engineering and so forth. Um, uh, my peer uh, ended up leaving the company and I took over everything else under the supply chain umbre umbrella, sourcing procurement, uh, logistics, transportation, warehousing, inventory planning, um, and kept manufacturing quality assurance, continuous improvement, et cetera. Did that for about six and a half years. Went to Kimberly Clark for a while doing the same thing and then went to Cummins. And then I decided to go back to where I started on the agency side. So I uh, can provide a pretty unique perspective when it comes to both, you know, working on the inside of some large corporations with some very dynamic and complex uh, supply chain organizations. All of those companies I mentioned have been um, have made the top supply, top 25 supply chain for Gartner, the list they put out every year. Um, so I got to pick up some good experience, and I've seen a lot of these uh, these hiring and retention strategies, um, you know, firsthand, especially in the corporate environment, and have been involved um, uh, with putting some of these strategies into place myself. <clears throat> uh, we mainly work with companies that do manufacturing, uh, retail, wholesale distribution, uh, e-commerce, and we work with some service providers as well. Uh, offering retained executive search, contingency search. Um, we are doing contract staffing as of recently. Do career coaching, uh, serve as the career coach for Apex, have been doing that um, for their 45,000 members ever since 2014. And uh, we work across a lot of different industries as well um, with a core focus on you know, supply chain management and everything under that umbrella. So with that being said, let's... Uh, if you're if we're not connected, I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. There's my email address too if you'd like to reach out and uh, we're very active on Twitter sharing you know trends and best practices and supply chain hiring uh, through that channel. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start out with you know what is the problem? Why are so many companies experiencing difficulty when it comes to hiring and retaining supply chain talent? And there's a lot of studies that have been put out on this from Deloitte to DHL. Um, and other companies, including supply chain associations such as Apex. Uh, DHL put out a really uh, nice report, a white paper recently on the supply chain talent gap. Um, they're estimating that 25 to 33% of the current workforce is uh, either at or beyond the retirement age. Uh, just think about that. You're going to have a quarter uh, to a third of existing supply chain professionals um, moving to retirement. That's gonna right there create a pretty big gap in itself. Um, we're, they've got a, um, obviously it's supply and demand problem here. Uh, six to one 
is the current ratio. I've actually seen that same number reported out through Deloitte through some of their research. That's the number of openings that exist compared to uh, the number of qualified individuals. That's a, that's a crazy ratio just to think about. Uh, up through their survey, 25% um, view supply chain as equally as important as other areas. So obviously we've got some work to do um, with uh, getting more companies to understand the importance of supply chain. It's not about cost cutting, it's about enabling growth as well. <clears throat> And then one third of companies have taken no steps to improve their ability to uh, create uh, a talent pipeline within the supply chain space. Only one third of the companies they surveyed. Um, one of the uh, factors uh, impacting the supply chain talent shortage as well is the, the rapid evolution of job requirements. Uh, we have seen that firsthand, uh, just going back to my days of recruiting at Home Depot. Supply chain was really new to them. They didn't have a department, obviously. I, I helped build that 13-person department. I remember seeing uh, presentations presented to the board of directors, you know, showing what Walmart was doing in the space and what Target was doing in the space. So Home Depot wanted to follow suit because they, like many companies, were operating with a silo-driven uh, organization competing against one another. They weren't really integrated from a supply chain uh, perspective. So factor in all the different technology advancements. You've got robotics. You've got artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of these things, uh, the data analytics, big data cloud, everything's impacting the, the job requirements at a very rapid pace. Uh, we've mentioned the baby boomers retiring in droves. And unfortunately, um, the academic community um, and so forth has not uh, been able to keep up with um, with you know bringing up talent through the ranks to replace this uh, this generation, globalization, companies outsourcing, you know suppliers, they're exporting, importing. Um, that's created a new challenge as well from a skill set perspective. Uh, you've got issues with compensation. I just got off the phone with a, a potential client a little while ago that called in and uh, was asking me about compensation for materials management, and I just mentioned that it, it's 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 only going up. And I would say that for a lot of different supply chain positions. So companies are, are, are starting to, to fill the pinch when it comes to having to fork out higher compensation just to, just to land the talent that they're looking for from a supply chain perspective. Um, from what I have uh, witnessed, um, you know, both working with you know, corporations um, on my corporate days of recruiting to working with clients today, we work with a lot of small, medium-sized company and companies um, across a lot of different industries, and um, I'm seeing a lot of common mistakes that are being made, typically um, around the talent acquisition, or retention, and development. Um, you know, companies really aren't putting forth the right investment from a people process systems perspective, and we're going to get into some of those things that we can do to make improvements here in a little bit. Um, but we've got this macro level problem. It's across a lot of industries and it's going to take many years to resolve. You've got academics. I mean, back when I started recruiting in supply chain, there were maybe six or so universities that offered supply chain degrees or related degrees. And now you've got dozens, dozens. And many schools are looking for professors right now to teach supply chain courses. Um, so that's a great thing, but it's going to take many years um, to, to get people to come up through the ranks. We've had a branding issue. Um, people have kind of, you know, a lot of times I tell people what I do for a living, supply chain, and they, during the headlights, look, what is what is supply chain? Um, and so a lot of people don't know what it is, and uh, I think they've we've done a collectively done a, a poor job over the years of branding supply chain as a great career choice. So that's your macro level problem. Um, from a micro level perspective, you know, what can companies do? What are companies doing wrong? Um, you know, they can't certainly wait around. You can't rely on some of the old <laughs> Uh, tactics for generating candidates. Um, we call it post and pray in the recruiting industry where you post jobs and wait for the best applicants to apply. i um, hearing more and more and more from our clients and companies that reach out to us that uh, that's just not doing the job. And we can see why. The data is there and um, it speaks for itself. So I'm going to get into some tactics and strategies that any company can do. A lot of these are low cost and high yield. Um, again, I've put some of these programs into place back in my corporate days, and I've seen many other companies, especially top employers, um, put these programs into place as well. Um, the last point here is I think a lot of companies underestimate 
the complexity and difficulty of just recruiting in supply chain. It is such a broad and diverse uh, discipline of a business uh, function. And it, again, it hasn't been around for as long as finance, accounting, IT, and other other traditional you know corporate functions that have been around since companies have been around. So um, it's a lot of ambiguity. There's no such thing as a one size fits all supply chain. Um, you know, a lot of our clients come to us. They've they've engaged the you know the recruiters they've used for other functions. They say, oh well, we can do supply chain. And um, again, it's just you know you have to have the ability to to understand it and to assess the supply chain or the client supply chain you're dealing with, um, because that right there tells you the type of candidate that you need to go out and find. Um, it's the, the complexity is compounded when so many companies have so many different job titles for the same thing. Uh, you can get plenty of examples there, like warehouse managers. You've got companies like Target that call their folks group leaders. Uh, Amazon, I think, use area managers and so forth. So uh, everybody calls things different titles. And as a recruiter, it can be very challenging to cut through that grayness and that ambiguity. So we'll get into uh, some tactics I'm going to start out where everyone needs to start out, and that is with workforce planning. <clears throat> so here's the 10 strategies. If you have downloaded our ebook, you've already read through some of this material. I'm going to be going through these one by one, and then we'll save time at the end for Q and A, as, as Katie had pointed out. <clears throat> so workforce planning study. When I was at Coca-Cola, leading their supply chain recruitment, uh, I was asked by our director. Hey, we're going to take on the workforce planning. It's been decentralized. HR has been leading it. Uh, we want talent acquisition to do it. We're going to show you how to do it. Um, so I've actually been involved with doing one of these studies, and it was an eye opener. I, you know, I never really thought about things from a holistic perspective. Um, but if you're in supply chain, um, you probably uh, understand the supply chain planning um, aspects, uh, such as uh, demand planning, forecasting, you know, trying to forecast what you're going to sell so you can make and fulfill that. Um, that forecast on the on the production or on the supply side. So you're trying the holy grail of supply chain really is trying to figure out what you're going to sell that and balance that demand with the supply. So you've got the optimal inventory levels in place, right place, right time, right cost. Um, that's what everyone's trying to figure out. So same thing. This is it's really a similar process uh, as uh, sales operations planning or integrated business planning. You know, you're going to gather business leaders within supply chain, within your operations, within HR, within your talent acquisition and talent development uh, groups, and you're going to get these folks together. Now, before you do that, you're going to want to gather your data uh, as it relates to hiring, uh, looking at your attrition. You know, where are we losing people? You know, oftentimes you see that at the hourly level out in the facilities, um, and we hear there's a lot of pain right now with so many e-commerce companies popping up. You know, Amazon opening. Fulfillment centers right and left, and uh, competing um, for hourly labor, and um, it's very competitive out there on that side um, of, of the house. <clears throat> but basically, you're looking at uh, reviewing, um, you know, your core data. Um, you know, how many people did we hire last year? How many people did we hire the year before? What is our growth rates? Uh, what is our attrition rates? Uh, why are we losing people? Uh, looking at the recruiting metrics as well. How long does it take to fill a position? And you're looking at not just any position, but across your different departments and your different job classifications, your different job grades. Do we have any strategic hiring initiatives? You know, I mentioned that we you know, built uh, Home Depot's uh, uh, supply chain department back in the early 2000s. That's a major strategic hiring initiative. Um, are we opening any facilities, any DCs, any manufacturing plants? Obviously, that's going to impact um, <clears throat> the resources you'll need to fulfill those types of positions. You've got mergers acquisitions. Are we going to be buying any companies? Um, are we divesting any of our business units? You've got, you've got succession plans um, that should be in place. Um, you figure out who's retiring. Um, all of those things. There's a lot of data there that you need to gather. And you're going to get your key stakeholders together. Uh, you're going to go through that data, and that's really going to help you, you know, try to understand um, the at least over a time period, um, you know, put a forecast together. Now, forecasts are rarely going to be accurate, but it at least gives you a baseline so you can start planning um, for how you're going to resource uh, your talent acquisition and development part department. Um, so very important. I said, you know, if you're a small small company, this should be very very easy. <clears throat> if you're a large company like Coca-Cola, this is an exhausting effort, and it's a 
took me a while to sit down with all these different, um, you know, the VP of logistics, the VP of manufacturing, and, and across that organization with hundreds, I mean, actually thousands of people. <clears throat> so I sat down with the leaders, uh, the HR leaders as well, and, you know, we, we all did this in Excel. Um, there are systems out there nowadays that can help you with this effort. Um, but basically, you just want to get this base on so you can figure out how you're going to meet the demand um, for your talent needs. And you're also going to want to conduct a SWOT analysis. You're going to want to understand, you know, what are we good at? What, where are our weaknesses? Um, you know, what are our opportunities for improvement? And what are the threats to our business? You know, is Amazon opening a facility next to ours? Um, they tend to pay very well at, at their uh, fulfillment centers. And so, you know, you want to start looking at that type of data uh, as well. And then from there, you're going to basically identify um, areas for improvement or your gaps and put in some corrective action plans around uh, resources needed um, to fulfill that forecast. Um, so from an internal perspective, um, you know, okay, we need, we understand that recruiting and supply chain is getting more difficult due to the talent shortages. Um, you're going to probably want to maybe beef up that that infrastructure there, whether it's uh, you know getting a really solid recruiter internally, um, it could be just be adding people to the staff. Maybe you've got a 1980s recruiting system that you need to replace to help streamline your ability to source. Um, you know, maybe you need to increase your budget. Those are the things you're going to figure out using that data. Uh, from an external perspective, you know, perhaps you're going to get your baseline for what you think you're going to need to fill. Um, throughout the year and then if you have any hiring spikes or you all of a sudden you you do lose uh, some people to one of your competitors you know you want to have some contingency resources or plan B resources in place um, so maybe identify some some search firms that might work um, to help fill these critical needs that your internal team may not have time to fill or can't fill um, there are RPO organizations out there that can handle some of the high volume recruiting needs actually worked with a couple of those before in the past. Um, maybe you need a staffing firm uh, or staffing firms. Um, so those are the kind of plan B resources that you need to help supplement your internal staff. And you might want to evaluate from a cost perspective, does it make sense to outsource to an RPO? And I've worked in that environment as well. <clears throat> um, and then you want to identify, okay, we know we've got some opportunities here that we need to improve upon, and that's what I'm getting ready to get into. Um, to improve our ability to hire, retain, uh, and develop talent. So um, one, one great tactic, um, I think a lot of companies do this like haphazardly. They don't really have a strategy around it, but obviously networking is, you know, oftentimes leads to people getting jobs. I, as a career coach for Apex, I, I tell folks, Hey, applying to jobs is the last thing you want to do. You really want to focus your time and energy on networking and proactively reaching out to people at target companies, building relationships, seeing if you can contact the hiring manager proactively as opposed to simply applying online and waiting for someone to get back to you. Uh, same thing applies to, um, to uh, you know, getting your organization to go out and actively recruit um, candidates. And uh, the easiest place to do this would be by, by simply joining um, a supply chain association or logistics or procurement. You've got APIC, CSCMP, uh, IBF on the uh, planning side. You've got work on the warehousing uh, distribution side. So there's a association for everything, right? And then you just need to figure out which ones are the best avenues that align with my particular business. I mean, if you're focused in the 3PL arena, uh, it probably makes sense to join, you know, CSCMP or, or a WERC. Um, so just figure out what is that best association. Um, you're going to want to sit down and, and put some goals and objectives. I mean, you, you need to do that with everything in life, everything in business. So put a plan and a strategy together. Um, that involves uh, um, figuring out those associations, number one. But you also uh, want to identify people on the team that would they'd make good an ambassadors for your organization that can really go out and um, help you know, network and, and sell uh, your opportunity and, and sell your company. <clears throat> Um, you want to definitely pay the association fees. Um, you know, it's a pretty minimal cost for the return you're going to get. Just from a learning and development perspective alone, um, it's a fantastic investment. So I've been a member of CSCMP, a member of APEX, and other associations for many years, and uh, uh, great places to, to, to learn. And, and obviously, they've got fantastic certification programs as well. So the investment, you know, alone is worth uh, – 
is worth uh, the learning and development that you get out of it, that your associates will get out of it. <clears throat> but you also want to encourage participation at the association chapter events, uh, send them on to conferences and things like that. Um, and uh, the place to start really is uh, once you get through your goals and objectives, um, I think putting a you know basic training curriculum together around you know how to network, um, teach them some basic icebreakers for initiating conversations. Um, you want to make sure you've got a very consistent message when it comes to how you go about with describing your company and the opportunity and the selling points, the culture, and things like that. If you're going to events as a sponsor, uh, we'll, we'll be at Apex um, in October at their conference. We'll have a booth. Um, and the last thing you want to do is sit there at that booth all day long. Um, you know, before you go to the event, uh, try to identify some who are the companies that'll be there, who are some of the attendees, who are some of the speakers. Those could be viable contacts for for your team to try to reach out to. Uh, even before the event, um, you know, look at those lists and see if you can proactively reach out to folks to set up meetings. Uh, when you get to the event, obviously you you, you know you want to get out with business cards and try to you know, work the event. Go by the booths, uh, go attend certain um, educational sessions. Um, if you're looking for demand planning talent, like a lot of companies are right now, um, or SNOP or IBP talent, um, if they've got a session on that topic, you may want to go to that. Have your associates go to that particular session to see if they can. You know, get there early and, and meet with people, and even afterward, um, you know, try to try to you know identify people that could be potential candidates. After the event, very important to get back, uh, get the team that attended the event together for a debrief session. Uh, have your uh, maybe one of your supply chain leaders participate. Um, get all the business cards out around the round table. Get your especially get your recruiter involved, and then you're going to basically assign who does what next in terms of follow up. Uh, even if you don't have any openings, I think it's, uh, you know, if you, if you found an A player candidate that you want to keep in touch with for future opportunities, you know, determine who's going to be keeping in touch with that person, maybe get them out for lunch or coffee. And uh, consider, you know, putting some incentives in place, like a contest to see who generates the most referrals to these events, you know, an extra day off or some type of cash reward or something like that. <clears throat> so that's uh, one avenue. Um, that uh, anybody that's you know that belongs to an association, especially um, a chapter in a major metro area that's very active. I know when I was in Atlanta for 14 years in supply chain recruiting, uh, both the CSCMP and Apex chapters they were huge. You know, hundreds of people would sometimes attend these events. So those are great places to get out and network and to find candidates. Leadership development programs. Um, again, I was involved uh, with this before. I've done it. I've been involved once with cr helping to create a program and to recruit candidates for it. Um, you know, a lot of large employers will use this tactic, but this can be actually a very cost-effective way. And you're going to have some travel expenses involved. Um, you know, you're probably going to want to have a, a, at least a part-time resource, if not a full-time resource, depending on the size of the recruiting class you're bringing in. But basically, a leadership development program. Is uh, it's a way um, for you to rotate candidates. Now these are going to be top tier candidates uh, coming out of college, or at least junior level candidates that you're going to want to accelerate their learning from a supply chain perspective in the core areas of your business and your operations. For example, uh, you can um, you know have someone do a four or six month rotation at a manufacturing plant. Next, they go into a distribution center. Uh, next, they spend time in your sourcing and procurement organization. Next, they go into your inventory uh, demand supply planning organization. It really depends on, you know, where are the, the major um, opportunities uh, that you have? Where are the growth areas in your company? Where's the biggest demand uh, for talent? Um, so that's a fantastic way to accelerate the learning and the leadership development. It's a great tool, though, for recruiting. Um, I, I tell you, a lot of the large industrial companies have been using this across not just supply chain or operations, but other areas of their business. Um, you know, Honeywell, uh, General Electric is, uh, you know, well known for their um, for their excellence excellence in leadership development uh, programs. <clears throat> it can also help from a retention perspective. You know, when you put that investment into uh, you know, training people, sending them out to different operations that's going to improve their retention rate. Hey, they're going to also tell their friends how, how awesome the company is. 
And again, the key thing is, is this is a great way to accelerate supply chain leaders within your company. Um, so some of the keys to uh, success, and I'll tell you, when I was at Home Depot and helped build out their first leadership development program, it was really just me and the director of HR. We had one of our HR managers involved, and then you know we had eh, some sponsorship from from the executive team. Um, there were a lot of uh, things that we did not do well when we put that together. Um, you know, it wasn't um, organized the best that it could be. We didn't have the the level of sponsorship, you know, the level of mentorship and things like that. So that was a great lesson learned, though, and I learned kind of what not to do and, and what to improve upon. And it wasn't a failure. We had some great candidates go through that process. I think it was just a team of four people, and they did rotate through different areas of the business across the country, and they went on to, um, you know, to, uh, to bigger and better um, positions within the company. Uh, and I'm still friends with a couple of folks that we put through that program. <clears throat> But you want to have, ideally, especially if you're a mid-sized or large company, you want to have somebody that is just the designated go-to person, the program manager. Um, you do want to have some kind of a plan to go after these top candidates. Where are we going to get these from? You know, typically, your top supply chain universities would be a great place to start. Um, but you could also look internally if you've got someone that you've hired, you've identified them as a high potential, you want to accelerate their career, um, you feel like they're a long-term um, asset to the company. Uh, you can certainly put those individuals uh, into the program as well. Uh, most companies do a you know, two-year rotation, six, four, six-month rotations in the different areas of the business. Um, that executive sponsorship is actually critical. Uh, that's one thing we didn't have probably enough of when I was at Home Depot back in the day, and we tried to put this thing together. Um, you want to have a mentor for every single person in there. That is extremely critical. Make sure it's a very strong leader within the organization that can help um, you know, remove obstacles, accelerate their learning, and, and, and also make uh, facilitate introductions to people within the company. Um, put in some performance objectives so the candidates or the participants understand what they're going to get out of the program and have some goals to tackle. You want to have, have some projects that they're going to help lead or participate in that can add value to your company while they're going through the program. Um, provide training. Uh, there should be a, a training curriculum developed for this specific. It could be advancing their Excel skills or um, certain tools such as uh, you know, ERP system or supply chain planning tools, you know, whatever is needed there. Um, and then provide constant and consistent feedback. Very important um, for everyone involved. Um, you want to obviously, uh, you know, get to the end of the program and hopefully you've got um, a job vacancy that you have left open to place these individuals in, that is very important. Um, and then from there, um, you take the you know continuously measure you know how you know survey uh, that will involve both from the attendees as well as the participants that are help leading um, their uh, learning uh, and training. Um, you know throughout the rotations, take that feedback and use it to drive continuous improvement. I would also recommend um, doing some benchmarking with companies like GE and other companies that have a strong reputation for their LDP programs. <clears throat> uh, I, I see many, many companies make a lot of mistakes in this area of career branding. Um, it comes from job descriptions that are just chock full of skills. Uh, they don't talk about the core objectives of the job, the key deliverables, what the candidate is going to benefit from moving into the role, the impact the person can make to the organization, maybe not just supply chain, but the overall organization, um, the challenges the, the role needs to fulfill, and things like that. A lot of companies go straight into listing out the the, the wish list. Um, and you know, I know if, if you're on this call, I know if you've looked at on any job board, you know what I'm talking about. So job description, that's one area that is, it takes time, it's a pain, it's a pain. But um, if you put the effort into it and if you get it right, at least get that bowler template set up that you can repurpose that, that does a great job of storytelling, you know, your company, where you've been, where you're at today, where you're trying to grow to, recaps the supply chain organization and covers those key deliverables. Um, that's, that's more important than listing out, well, you know, I want this, I want that. Um, it's just an arbitrary list of skills and qualifications, and um, it's going to do uh, more, it's going to deter candidates more than attract candidates. So focus on that. Um, but when you look at your overall employer branding, and you know, going back to my Home Depot days, um, we had some really, really sharp people 
that were dedicated to employer branding. I mean, those guys were very innovative and very creative, and that's the way you need to think. Think like a marketer. And actually, better yet, get your marketing department or someone from the marketing department um, that can come in um, into your, you know, whether it be your recruiting organization, um, where you can um, you know, put some projects together to improve your branding. Um, but you obviously, you know, most companies do a decent job of this on their website, um, describing who they are, their history. But if you haven't gotten that basic information in there, at a minimum, you want to do that. Um, make sure it's consistent um, across the entire organization. You know, make sure, you know, recruiters, they have a, a certain format for the job descriptions. Uh, not everyone is doing their own thing. I've definitely seen that before. And it just looks unprofessional from a candidate perspective. You don't want to deter candidates. You want to attract candidates. Um, I would also, you know, um, we're very big into this ourselves. We've got, um, you know, from our our website and what we do uh, to attract candidates, we're constantly putting out content designed to help people accelerate their careers in supply chain, whether it's how to write a better resume. Uh, think, think like that, though. You want to add value, uh, provide tips. Uh, you also want to showcase, um, you know, some stories from your employees that work in supply chain. And you can do that on their website. Most large companies have already moved into this. Uh, if you go to any, go to Coca-Cola, they have their own separate career site and they'll have videos of employees talking about their careers in supply chain and things like that. <clears throat> um, copy is great, uh, but you wanna have images, incorporate infographics. And again, videos are very powerful and it's very easy to, to, to upload those um, to any website especially any career website. Um, ideally, you want to have your you know, applicant tracking system integrated as well. Um, and find a way to, um, you know, from a marketing perspective, you know, once you get the candidates, you attract them, well, what happens next? Um, you know, it's almost physically impossible for a you know, recruiting team to reach out to, to every candidate that applies. Um, but there are, are a lot of uh, really cool tools, we'll get into that to a minute, that can help facilitate the you know, the communications to these candidates and just keeping them on your radar screen. <clears throat> Direct sourcing, um, if there's uh, anything you walk away with today, I think this is probably gonna be number one is, uh, you know, nowadays, you, again, you can't rely on posting and praying to, to generate a strong applicant pool. Uh, you have to go out and proactively source candidates. I mean, that is what I've done my whole career. Uh, now, granted, in some of the large companies I worked at with their brand recognition, uh, oftentimes we would get some pretty decent candidates supplying, of course. Uh, they have a ridiculous database of candidates we could tap into. But if you're a small, medium not sized company, you don't have that brand recognition. You've got to work extra hard um, to go out and find talent. Um, and if you're only posting jobs, you're only getting a small portion of the available applicant pool, uh, those that are actively looking for new positions uh, that are looking at the job every day, that's a very small fraction of the available pool of uh, talent that's out there. You're basically fishing from uh, a pond versus the ocean. So you definitely want to incorporate both your uh, job postings. I mean, you, you know, it, it doesn't hurt to, to keep those up because um, every once in a while you get lucky and it also helps to brand your company, but you definitely want to put in a, a proactive strategic sourcing um, a regimen um, from a recruiting perspective where you are identifying companies that would have the talent uh, within your local markets. Uh, maybe it's a, comp a competitor or other companies in your industries or related industries, but you want to have a sense of the types of companies that are going to have the type of talent from a cultural fit, from a functional, technical, and, and so forth perspective um, that align well with your supply chain um, that could come in and you know assimilate well and hit the ground running. Obviously, partnering with supply chain universities is, you know, a lot of companies are doing that. Um, so you want to identify those universities that fit your core criteria, your values, your culture, and things like that. Because not every university is, they're all different. And so they all have different programs and they attract different types of people. So figure out which one's best aligned with your business needs. Uh, clearly, you want to identify, you know, hit, do the job fair thing, and um, that's a, um, you know, a pretty, pretty easy way, but it's very competitive out there. So the best strategy, especially what we have found, is simply trying to reach out and build relationships with supply chain professors. I've got relationships myself with certain professors, um, and if you can, um, 
you know, build that relationships. Oftentimes you can reach out to them and they will tell you who their best students are. And uh, you can sometimes have, I don't want to say first dibs, but at least be aware of who those students are. Uh, we mentioned uh, like when I was at Coke, we, of course, they're getting at three, four, 500 applicants for every position in any big Fortune 500 company probably gets that type of volume. Um, and, and many of those, you know, were not a fit, but over time, that database is going to get ridiculous. So if you don't have an applicant tracking system where resumes can kind of go into a database um, where you can search them later, um, you know, you're really missing out on a great opportunity. So, um, you know, have your recruiters, uh, and you have to have enough recruiters, go out and data mine that database um, and proactively reach out to candidates. That's the first place we look. I've had mine for going on. I don't know, 13 years or so. I've been through three of these uh, recruiting systems, and uh, that is the first place we go um, when we search for candidates to fill our positions. Uh, we talked about a supply chain associations um, and how you can leverage those um, going out to chapter meetings, going to their conferences, but there's also another feature that most of them have, which is called an online membership directory. Uh, I'm listed in several of these myself, and you can go out and log in and search the directory by keyword, by title, by location, that's another great place. Um, hey, I'm, I'm a member of Apex, I found you in the in their directory, you know, would love to reach out to you, have a conversation about opportunities, things like that. Now be careful with that, you know, you're not supposed to solicit, uh, sell people services and products and things like that, but I think from a networking perspective, that is what it's for. <clears throat> Paid recruiting tools, you know, I've, I've worked with companies that kind of have been on the cheap. Uh, you know, they don't think it's important. Uh, they undervalue the recruiting function, potentially treat it like the redheaded stepchild and necessary evil, whatever you want to call it. But you've got to step up your game. You've got to direct source talent if you want to compete with the talent shortage and win the war for talent. LinkedIn Recruiter is by far one of our top tools. All of our recruiters here at SCM Talent Group have licenses, and we have access to the entire database. A ridiculous amount of filters to help hone in on the right candidates, great messaging features to reach out and engage with candidates. Um, we've also got access to other tools uh, here at SCM Talent Group. Um, you know, Data.com is a direct a database of, of uh, candidates. Um, again, names, titles, companies that you can search by keyword and so forth. Um, when it comes to job postings, um, again, you know, we, we do that a little bit here, but 99% of what we do is direct source. Um, but we do have, a, a, you know, with our LinkedIn package, certain job postings as we post there. Um, if you are going to post, though, what we have found is that you're going to get better quality. Uh, you may not get the quantity, but you'll definitely get the better quality if you focus on uh, niche job boards. Um, supplychainjobs.com is one, jobsandlogistics.com. There's a few others out there. Those are two of the bigger ones. And then, and get creative when it comes to direct sourcing. Um, you want to try and do something different than the rest of your competitors are doing. Uh, one of the things we've been experimenting with here is uh, sponsoring content on LinkedIn where you can actually pick out companies, um, company names you can filter by, uh, certain job titles, uh, obviously locations. Um, and a lot of other neat uh, targeting features, uh, industry and things like that, where you, you know, if somebody's on LinkedIn, your ad will pop up right in front of them. Um, so you can get pretty creative with that. And I would encourage you to, to uh, experiment. It's a, maybe reallocate your job post, your job board dollars into sponsoring, you know, job based ads, targeted ads on places like LinkedIn uh, and Facebook. We haven't done a lot on Facebook, but we definitely have done it on uh, LinkedIn with some, with some success. <clears throat> Moving along, uh, mentorship, um, you know, this is pretty straightforward stuff. You know, a lot of companies have mentorship programs. This, this kind of speaks to, um, you know, retention. And um, I think it's an excellent way, especially from a supply chain perspective, where you've got such a broad and diverse group of people. And a lot of times in supply chain, I hear this a lot, people get kind of stuck in a, in a certain area. Like I've worked in transportation for 15 years. I'm having a hard time moving into other areas of supply chain. Um, and I tell you what, if you can get your employees um, aligned with the right mentor, um, it, there's just so many benefits. Um, you know, obviously learning um, and, and facilitating introductions and things like that, but it's just really good for you know, cross-training uh, your company. 
Uh, these are very uh, cost-effective uh, programs you can put together, um, but you want to start out with um, defining your objectives and goals. Hey, what are we going to you know, try to get out of this? Are we trying to improve our employee engagement? Are we trying to improve our retention? Are we trying to accelerate learning? You know, what are the uh, core objectives that you need for your business? And then you can put together a program. Um, you probably want to have somebody that's going to obviously coordinate the program, and then you want to have a, a steering committee involved as well. Um, ideally, you know, your, your top or most senior supply chain executive, or at least someone on his or her team, <clears throat> they can really help um, define the program, the objectives, um, and so forth. From there, obviously, men mentorship is about pairing the mentor, the right mentor, with the uh, right mentee. Um, you can do that manually. Uh, there's also, of course, there's software systems for everything these days. Um, but there is, uh, there are some software systems that can help facilitate that mentorship map up, match up. And then you've got associations as well. And if you don't want to put this together for your company, Apex. If you, if you're big into, you know, having your employees uh, sponsored, you know, for association uh, memberships with uh, Apex or other. Um, associations, a lot of them have put mentorship programs together. Apex has put one together and they've actually just uh, improved it and they recently relaunched it, um, I think the other day. <clears throat> put the framework in place. These are just basic communication templates for when your mentor or mentee is meeting. They need to have some kind of an agenda. They need to leave, they need to leave that, me that meeting with their mentor with an action plan and then when they come back they need to report out on, on what they accomplished. Um, you know, you want to have a start date and an end date. You don't want mentorships to go on forever. And then at the end, collect the feedback. You're going to use that feedback uh, to figure out what you did well, what you can improve upon, and just work to continuously improve the mentorship program. Um, again, many large companies will, will have these across the whole organization. But if your company is in the, you know, service uh, side of the house, uh, 3PL or carrier or a consulting company, you know, this is just a really fantastic way to um, and it, again, it doesn't really cost a whole lot of money, if anything, to set this up. It's more of just the involvement of time. <clears throat> uh, number seven, uh, again, this is uh, super easy to put together. If you don't have an employee referral program, that's probably the place that I would recommend starting. It's, it's easy. Uh, you can do it manually, um, especially if you're a small to medium-sized company. You just want someone that's going to be leading that program, typically your supply chain recruiter. Um, would be ideal, um, but if you don't have a recruiter and your HR partner does the recruiting, of course that person would be um, would be able to handle it as well. Um, and then you want some support driven by an executive. You have to have that sponsorship where that person stresses the importance of actively seeking out referrals for your openings. Um, there are some really cool tools out there. I've, I've done a demo with with uh, one of these before. Um, Jobvite is one. Jobcast is another. Uh, some of these tools serve as your applicant tracking system. They are wonderful, though, for um, you know making sure your employees are aware of the openings that exist in your company. Better yet, it gives them an easy platform for distributing, and I think that's the key word, is distributing the job to someone in their network. It could be through their LinkedIn network. Um, it could be through their you know their um, uh, your list of contacts, their emails. Um, there's some, again really cool software out there that can help facilitate this but if you really want to drive participation you know have some kind of incentive I know when I first went to Home Depot they had a as you can imagine a pretty you know, pretty good uh, employee referral program and I, I want to say back then when I first started they were giving away like BMWs for the person that had uh, the most referrals by the end of the year so put a really nice incentive in place and you're definitely gonna drive a lot of participation and you're gonna see a lot stronger results uh, number eight is uh, streamlining the hiring process. Uh, I see so many companies making mistakes um, from they don't kick off a search properly. Hey, here's a job description. Here's a salary. Go after it. That's that's going to lead to poor results. Um, you know, uh, lack of candidate feedback. Candidates go into the process. They go out. They never hear back. They get ghosted. Uh, you don't want to do that. Um, but the most common um, mistake that we see is just the time it takes for once we present candidates, getting feedback from the hiring managers, um, but also moving the candidates quickly through the process. We work with one large Fortune 500 company. It's been a few months ago. They are putting a new team together at corporate and uh, six rounds of interviews. I mean, these are management level jobs and they had to interview 
with not only the CFO, but the CEO separately too. So we had one poor guy go through eight rounds of interviews and he didn't even get up to the CEO level. He got deemed after eight rounds. That is unacceptable. And guess what? With social media, the word gets out that, oh, they've got this crazy process, horrible process. Um, and uh, that gets out to the masses, especially with social media. So um, you want to try to strive for a balance that, that can get candidates through the process quickly, but you don't want to sacrifice quality from a vetting and assessment perspective. But it all starts with that kickoff. Um, when, you, when you kick off the search properly, um, you've got the hiring manager and your recruiter aligned, joined at the hip. They know, you know, you know, you walk away with knowing what the plan is. You've got the profile crystallized. Um, you know exactly what you're going to look for, where you're going to look for these people. Um, you're going to understand what the key deliverables are. What is the mission or the objective of this role? I like to ask my number one question when I kick off a call with a hiring manager. Hey, what are the top three to five deliverables? And I want you to rank those from number one to five. That really forces them to think about what's the most important aspects of the job. As a recruiter, if I can get that information, I'm going to go out and find candidates that have done that. They can provide specific examples of how they've done it in the past. I'm going to document that. And when I present the candidate, um, the, ma the manager is going to know exactly how well their background aligns. And I'm going to have some examples that I can talk to of where they've done that successfully in the past. You're going to walk away from this uh, meeting with a solid sourcing strategy. You're going to know what kind of industries and companies you're going to go after. And you're going to proactively go out and direct source those candidates. You're going to agree to certain SLA, service level agreement. We had that term in corporate, but basically just what are the next steps? I need to, you know, typically, when do you want this job filled? Everybody says yesterday. So you know you're always going to be running up against uh, the clock to try to, to go out and find candidates. Um, getting them through the assessment interviewing process is critical. I see a lot of companies make the mistake of using cookie cutter questions for every single job. That is going to lead to uh, some issues with quality and getting the right candidates. Um, here at SM Talent Group, we take that criteria we get from the hiring manager on every single search. We customize our screening and assessment process around that criteria for every single search. Looking for uh, addressing core competencies from a leadership technical functional perspective um, and also looking at you know, past performance, um, being able to speak to that. You've got to drill out that past performance, relevant examples, making sure they're significant and align with your deliverables, um, but also, you know, making sure they can fit into your, your uh, operation. They've, they've worked at that level, in other words. Um, you know, obviously documenting the results and then getting back together um, for debriefs is very important. I think it's a good practice to have a, a meeting before the interviews take place to make sure all the interviewers are aligned with what you're looking for, the competencies, the questions, and then obviously right after, the sooner the better, um, this is the practice we did at the companies I've worked at, and it just facilitated everything um, and made sure that we were all in alignment when it come to making that final decision. And then from there, we take that criteria and we check references. We customize this form as well. It's not cookie cutter. We're making sure we're validating what the candidates tell us in the interview process with former direct supervisors, keyword direct supervisors, not a peer, not a friend, not a former work colleague, but somebody that has this individual has reported to. So um, streamlining the process is very important. Uh, time will kill all deals when it comes to recruiting, especially in supply chain. You have to act fast. You have to be prepared to make decisions. But again, don't sacrifice quality for speed. <clears throat> Number nine, right size the recruiting team. I've worked in organizations before where it was do more with less, do more with less, and you just can't afford to do that uh, when it comes to supply chain. You've got to enable um, and create a proactive model. Um, I've worked in places where there's one full life cycle recruiter. That was actually, um, yeah, yeah, I've done that. I won't go through the war stories there, but um, they handle everything. Uh, and you can get away with that. And if you're a smaller company, low volume, you know, somebody that does uh, working with hiring manager, getting the specs, finding the candidates, the, doing their offer letters and so forth. But I tell you, if you're a mid-sized company, you've got a lot of volume, a lot of challenges. You know, it might behoove you to set up where you've got a client-facing recruiter that really owns the process. Um, they drive it. They, uh, they have the relationships with the hiring manager. Then you might have somebody that does the candidate sourcing full-time. That's all they do is look for candidates, direct source, cold call, generate a pipeline of, count of candidates. 
Um, and then you want to make sure you're allocating any kind of administrative work to an administrative assistant or staffing coordinator. Um, I've worked in places where I even have clients that uh, like recruiting managers that are escorting candidates back and forth. They're doing the offer letters. They're posting jobs. They're doing all kinds of administrative work. That work there needs to be allocated to um, to the right person. So that way you can free up time um, for sourcers to do what they need to do and your recruiters to do what they do, which is to add value and, and, and fill candidates, fill positions with quality candidates. Um, make sure you have the right amount of people on your team. Um, again, I've, I've been in places where the teams have shrunk, but the volumes have increased. I've had 60 different supply chain jobs back in my corporate days. I think it's 60 plus was the most. And in that environment, it's 100% reactive, and the squeaky wheel, squeaky wheel is, is the person that gets the oil. So uh, you want to flip-flop that. You don't want to get too aggressive and have too many people, but you also want to have that right balance. Um, and put that baseline team in place. Allocate the duties depending on the person like we've talked about. Very critical. Um, but uh, you also want to have some backup, a contingency plan, a plan B. And that includes identifying recruiting partners that align well with your needs, because um, not all recruiters are created equal. Um, some specialize by different uh, functional areas, some by geography, some by industry. So find that right recruiting partner that's got a great reputation. Um, and then also um, you know, have some other partners as well. That way you, you hopefully can fulfill your forecast with your internal team. But if you can't, you've got somebody you can quickly reach out to for help. That's where kind of we serve as here at SM Talent Group is to help out when you've got that difficult, critical hiring need <clears throat> that you can't fill internally. All right, so we're about wrapped up. I'm just gonna quickly go through this last one so we've got some time for Q&A. Um, but recruiting nowadays, uh, just like supply chain, there's so many advancements in technology. Uh, we've got artificial intelligence in recruiting within our applicant tracking system. Um, and it does a lot of things um, you know, automatically for you. It can uh, you know, send out follow-up emails if you don't hear back from someone. So you definitely wanna make sure that you're using um, those tools. But uh, the best tool is the tool that has the least amount of clicks, um, the least amount of data entry. So I've, I've left a job before because their system was 1980s and I just could not. It was so much administrative work, it was frustrating, so I ended up leaving. Um, you want to make sure that you've got, um, from a cl compliance perspective, if you sell to the government, you've got certain um, you know, requirements that you've got to meet there. Um, ideally, you want to have it integrated with your website. Jobs can be posted to your social media channels um, at the click of a button. Um, and you also want to have uh, integration with an email service provider where everything can get baked into your calendar. You've got good syncing between the system um, and your day-to-day -day planning uh, tools. Um, and um, the, most importantly, we talked about direct sourcing being so important. It, the system has to allow you to filter candidates by keywords or locations, uh, radius to a zip code and things like that. And ideally, especially if you're a large company, uh, we talked about workforce planning. It'll make it so much easier if you can extract data from your uh, recruiting system into your HRIS system from onboarding new employees to reporting data, um, the financials with salaries and things like that. I mean, that's going big time and only really large companies need to really have that kind of sophistication. But uh, every company should have some type of applicant tracking system to help facilitate your hiring um, and to broadcast your openings and also you know, to make sure you're, you're fulfilling everything from a compliance uh, perspective. <clears throat> So those are the 10 strategies. Um, we have an ebook out. If you do not have it and you'd like to receive a copy, uh, you can simply email us and we'll get a copy of that to you right away. So now let's uh, move into Q&A. Uh, Katie, what questions do we have? Uh, thank you, Rodney. Um, like he said, the recorded webinar and a copy of this presentation will be sent out to all attendees as well as registrants. And as you can see on this page, Rodney's contact information is included. So feel free to reach out regarding any additional advice or questions you may, ha you may have. So the first question we have is, out of these 10 strategies, which do you believe is the best place to start and what would yield the best results? Well, I think really, um, you know, if I'm a, a company, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably go right into evaluation mode. I'm, I'm gonna assess, uh, you know, using that SWOT analysis, 
that's just an easy, a very easy uh, tool. Um, you know, what are our strengths? Um, you know, what are our weaknesses, our opportunities, and our threats? I'm going to probably apply that across all of these different areas. Um, do we have any of these programs in place? You know, making sure uh, are they generating the right results? I'm probably going to start there. I'd also look into where we're experiencing the most pain in our business. If you've got certain positions that you know you're either having high turnover or you're having a very challenging time with filling them and they're causing pain, they're actually causing turnover because somebody's having to do two or three different jobs. You want to address those quick wins and those pain points as fast as possible. Um, but looking overall at these 10, um, you know, it, it's so easy to put in an employee referral program. That is the place that I would start on the retention side. I think mentoring is a really easy program to put into place as well. And that can certainly help drive engagement and, and retention uh, within the organization. Um, but I would also look into the, on the recruiting side. We've talked about the macro level problems like as supply chain as a whole. It's going to take years to really address the talent shortage and to and to kind of uh, close that gap that we have right now, which is which is massive. Um, so as a company, you know, you really need to be thinking about if I'm going to stay alive and compete and um, and have a you know world class supply chain, you know, you're going to have to to uh, embrace the idea of going after candidates, direct sourcing talent. So the first thing I would address is to make sure you have the ability, the resources, the tools, the right person too. That's very important. Um, having the right recruiter um, that's not afraid to make calls, not afraid to go out and build relationships, uh, reach out to people, reach out to strangers. That, that's really critical for success. Great. Thank you for that. Another question we had is, what are the most difficult positions to fill in supply chain these days? And how does your firm go about sourcing and recruiting talent for these challenging roles? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. You know, I'm you know, looking back in the 20 years I've been recruiting in this space, going on 20. Um, you know, I would say today it's changed from from back then. I'd say today the the biggest some of the the biggest challenges we hear. I feel like it multiple times per week is really with uh, demand planning, um, sales and operations planning, integrated business planning, talent on that demand forecasting side. A lot of companies are. Uh, realizing the importance of putting in those uh, those uh, integrated planning routines. Uh, it's not just a supply chain thing. You've got folks involved from sales, from marketing, from finance. It really gets your business kind of a cross section of your business together um, to make sure they're in alignment with, hey, what are we going to sell? What kind of promotions are we running? Um, and things like that. And, and that skill, obviously, it's quantitative. There's analytical um, you know, background that you, you must have to be successful. But you also have to have the soft skills, the collaboration skills, and you know sometimes you don't get that uh, with a strong analytical mind. <laughs> um, and we hear that from candidates. It's not just me saying that. Um, I mean, from clients um, that are struggling with finding people that can push back with sales and challenge like, wait a minute, you said you're going to sell this. You didn't do it last month. And obviously, you're not going to say it like that, but um, you get the drift. Uh, those are those are very high demand um, positions. And then I think on the technology side as well, there's so many advancements in technology. Companies are digitizing their supply chain. Uh, they're trying to put in their omni-channel capabilities. Uh, Amazon, everybody's looking over their shoulder at Amazon. Um, are they going to come in and compete with my business or take market share? So everyone's trying to jump on the uh, online retail uh, e-commerce bandwagon. They've been doing that for years and just trying to keep up. Um, but I was also say robotics and things like that. A lot of companies are putting in automation. So any roles that have to do with that are in very high demand. Great. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. How do you recommend right sizing our recruiting team if we can't afford to bring someone on to do administrative tasks? That, that's a great question. Uh, you know, it sounds like you probably have your your recruiter or HR person that's doing everything from soup to nuts. And, and again, I think that's okay if you're a low volume, if you have low volume hiring needs. Um, but if you have to get to a place where let's say postings aren't doing the job, you've got to get out there and direct source, you've got to free up time for your recruiter or HR person to do that kind of work. And the only way to do that is to take some of that administrative burden off of his or her plate. If you cannot afford a full-time person, um, to do that kind of work, then you may want to look into bringing in someone temporary on a temporary basis. And there's all kinds of uh, websites out there where uh, you can go out and, and put in a, you know, put in a job spec, a statement of work, and you could find someone to do that on a virtual basis too, or by the hour. 
by the project. Um, there's all kinds of ways to slice it up, but you have other options. You don't have to hire someone on a permanent full-time basis. Uh, temporary um, should be fine, especially if you don't need that person full-time. Uh, maybe a job share, if you've got another assistant that can take that kind of work on, um, that's, uh, that's certainly another option for you to, to tap into. Great, thank you, Rodney, and thank you all for your time today. If we didn't get to your questions, we'll be sure to answer them in our follow-up email that will include both the presentation and a copy of the webinar. And this concludes our webinar for today. Thank you all for attending.